Um, so we are continuing in our sermon series today on the book of Acts. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 17 this morning. Uh, we started this a few weeks ago, and we were all the way through the first, uh, the, the first chapter that we came back to, which is uh, we started in chapter 16. Um, and if you think that, like, I've kind of randomly been picking where we start and stop when we've done this, because this is the third time we've started going through Acts, um, it's not random. Um, the first time we went through the book of Acts, we went through the first uh, nine, uh, nine or ten chapters, I believe. Um, that is the time that is focused on the early church still in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria. And then the second time we started, we did what we called, um, what is typically called um, Paul's first missionary journey. Um, it is my intent for us to get through Paul's second miss missionary journey in this chunk. Um, and then maybe coming back for his final missionary journey, or kind of we'll see kind of how the Holy Spirit leads us in that. But we're uh, picking this up in, in chapter 17 today. Um, and just a quick recap. Remember, the book of Acts is really the story of Jesus continuing his ministry. So it's, it's written by, the, by Luke, the same one who wrote the Gospel of Luke. It's written to the same audience. And he, he says at the beginning of, of Acts, Hey, Theophilus, the guy he's writing to, I'm writing these things to you so that you'll know kind of how Jesus' work continued. He didn't, um, after he ascended, what happened? And it's the story of the Holy Spirit coming on the early church to continue the ministry of Jesus. And it's them bringing the good news of who Jesus is to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, so that's where they were, the surrounding community, and then to the ends of the earth. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've talked about how Paul... Silas, Timothy, and Luke, they made their way, led by the Holy Spirit, into Europe. Um, they were in modern-day Turkey, and they were led by the Spirit to go to Macedonia, which is part of modern-day Europe, uh, just north of modern-day Greece. And actually, they're going to be in Greece right now. Um, so they go first to the town of Philippi in Macedonia, and, um, and they get arrested and uh, for... <laughs> They get arrested for um, casting a demon out of a girl, um, and uh, the, the owners don't like that, and they get arrested for it, but then they get released, and then they move forward, and we're going to pick up what happened to them after that today. So let's pray and dive into God's Word. Lord Jesus, we want to hear from you today. We need to. Lord, the song we just sang was, Lord, I need you. And it's true, we need you. We need you all the time. We need you guiding and leading and directing us. Lord, you, you are the king that we need in our lives. You're the one that we should be serving. Show us today um, what that struggle looked like in the, in the early church and how they handled it led by your spirit. Open your word to us today, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. <clears throat> so starting in, in chapter 17, verses 1 through 4, it says, Now when they had passed through Amph Amphipolis and Apollon, Apol easy words to say, Apollonia, I, I, I read Greek, you think I'd be, a, be a better at this, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. So um, they leave Philippi, and Paul and company, so this is Paul, Silas, Timothy, Luke, Paul and company, just easier to say, they travel about 30 miles south and west along the, this, this Greek or this Roman road called the Via Ignatia uh, to this a small town called Amphipolis, um, which is actually the capital of the first district of Macedonia. And it's pretty small. Um, and they stay there. We're not told how long they stay there, but because of the travel time, it was probable that they literally walked there, spent the night, and moved on. We don't have any story of them preaching there or doing anything else there. 
but that would make sense. They don't want to be like out on the road overnight. You know, there's bandits, there's people around. Um, and then the next day, probably, we don't know exactly the timetable here, but it would make sense. Again, it says that they went um, to another smaller town called um, Apollonia, which is named after the, the Greek god Apollos, or Apollo, rather, uh, the god of the sun. Uh, that's about another 27 miles along the coast. They probably stopped there for the night as well. And then they travel another 35 miles to Thessalonica, which is the capital of the second district and actually the entire province of Macedonia. Now, if you're visual, this is kind of the path they took. They went from Philippi, which is up here. This is, oh, by the way, all the blue there is water. That's all part of the Aegean Sea, which is the sea between on the east side of modern-day Greece, between Greece and Turkey, modern-day. Um, they start out in F Philippi. They go down to Am um, Ampho Ampaphos, um, and then they travel down to Polonia, and then they make their way along this road to Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica. By the way, if I slip and say Thessaloniki, that is what its modern day name is. It, this Thessalonica is still there. It's Thessaloniki is the is the modern um, modern title for that. Um, so Paul actually stops in Thessalonica for a reason, and he stays there for a while because um, it's a strategic location. It is a location that is a seaport on the, on the Thermiac Gulf of the Aegean Sea. Uh, that, that, it was a kind of a port town that linked the sea and the land routes to the interior of the rest of this region. And you might say, well, why didn't he stop in every little town and just, just preach there for a little while and move on? Because his time is limited. He knows this. And so he's being strategic. He's like, if we can go to a, a major urban center and share the gospel here and people come to know Jesus here, they will be better suited to go reach those smaller towns around them. It, and that's exactly what happened. It served as a center for the spread of the gospel to the whole Balkan Peninsula. The Balkan Peninsula, by the way, um, if you're younger, you're like, I don't know what that means. If you're a little older, you might be like, the Balkans. Yeah, there was like wars and stuff there recently, right? Yes. Macedonia, the modern-day um, country of Macedonia has been in the, in the, in the, kind of in the flux of war for years, uh, sometimes with Greece, sometimes with its other neighbors. Um, when I was growing up, the country of Yugoslavia was there. And you're like, what happened? Did it move? No, it doesn't exist as a country anymore. It's Slovenia. It's um, Herska Slovenia. It's, uh, um, it's all that region there. Um, I'm, I'm, my family is from Slovenia, so I, that's a kind of a strong pull to that region. Um, the gospel winds up being spread out of Thessalonica to all of that region. And we have historical data showing how that happened. Lots of historical texts. Actually, Paul's letter to the Romans and his letter back to the, the, his first letter back to this church, 1 Thessalonians, he refers to how your, your devotion to the gospel is evident to all in your region. Why? Because they were going out and telling people about Jesus. By the way, this is exactly the same thing that most missionaries still do. If you have a missionary go to a region that has not received the gospel or there is very little gospel uh, spread there, their goal isn't to go to every little town. Their goal is to go to an urban center. And you might say, what about the people in the little town? Well, that's what they do. They go to urban centers, they preach the gospel, they, they see people come to know Jesus, they get trained up as disciples, and then those native people are the best carriers of the gospel to their neighbors. It is exactly what happened in the early church. It is not what we did for missions um, coming out of the United States for a very long time. Out of the West for a very long time, we had the mentality of this is how we'll do missions. We'll go to a town, a village, anywhere. We'll set up a Western pastor to raise up a church and serve that church until they die and just hope it keeps going. And guess what happened? They normally didn't keep going. Because that wasn't what God ever wanted. 
it is always better to have somebody who is from that community be the lead. And that's what happens. You'll see Paul again and again in the New Testament. He will come into a community, he will, uh, he will preach the gospel, he'll train people up, and then he leads. And then who are their leaders? Their leaders are the people from that community. Who are their missionaries? It's people from that community. Who shares the gospel with the people in the next town over? The people from that community that have way more in common, both linguistically, culturally, you know, all of that stuff, than somebody who's foreign. That is still true to today. And, and, and so a lot of missions organizations have actually taken a step back to that New Testament model of saying, we want to raise up healthy churches wherever we're at. And those, the healthiest churches are the ones that are led by people from those communities. By the way, that's not just true in foreign fields. That's true here, too. I am not from your community. I think some of you are painfully aware of that, but I'm not. I am a foreigner here. And I could live here the rest of my life. I could live, I could live in a, a, a shack across the street, and I'll still be a foreigner here. It won't matter. I'm always going to be an outsider. Why? Because you guys have a close-knit community where everybody knows each other. And anytime somebody moves in from somewhere else, it takes a really long time, sometimes generations, before they become one of us. And the gospel resonates so much clearer from somebody who is one of us than somebody who is not one of us. Which is why the number one sharer of the gospel in any community is the church from that community. Much more so than it is somebody like me. And you might say, yeah, but you're from Minnesota. Yeah, I'm even from kind of a relatively small, well, I'm from Hibbing originally, which isn't small, but it's not cities. I, I served in, in Hinckley for 11 years and got along, you know, fit in pretty well because I was from kind of a similar background. But it's different. Every setting is different. Because you guys have more in common with your neighbors than I ever will. You guys are the better carriers of the gospel than any outsider ever will be. And that's why, in part, Paul says, let's go to Thessalonica. We'll have the biggest bang for our buck in our time. Not to mention his strategic goal here is that he would go to find a synagogue. He'd find Jews first, and he'd say, you're going to hear about who Jesus, this Messiah, is, and it will make sense to you. To a Gentile, I'll have to do a whole lot more explaining. And so there wasn't synagogues in every little town. I mentioned last week how, or two weeks ago, how when they go to Philippi, which is pretty big, there's not enough Jews in Philippi to have a synagogue. There's a prayer meeting, but that's about it. Here, Thessalonica, which is even bigger than Philippi, they have... They have a synagogue. So that's what he does. He goes to the synagogue. He goes to a, an urban center. He finds the synagogue, and he preaches. It says three Sabbaths in a row. What does that mean? It means three Saturdays he goes to the synagogue. The Sabbath was Saturday. And they go, so three weeks in a row he's there. By the way, if you want to know what modern-day Thessaloniki looks like, uh, you can kind of see it in the background. This is actually a picture of Thessaloniki, modern-day Thessaloniki. Um, he goes to the synagogue three weeks in a row, and he uses the Old Testament. It says scripture, but for them, that's the Old Testament. They don't have the New Testament yet. And he uses Old Testament prophetic texts that foretold about the Christ. So he uses scripture, and he says, let me show you from scripture about what we know about the Christ. And he points to texts in places like Isaiah and Ezekiel. He points to things from the Psalms. He points all the way back probably to, to even Genesis and points to who is the Messiah, what does Scripture tell us about this Messiah, and he specifically points out, if you look quite carefully at the text, it tells us the Messiah will suffer and die. And he uses Scripture to prove it. Now you might say, okay, sure, we get it. Jesus is the Messiah, he suffered and died. Now, it's actually pretty revolutionary language in that day because, yes, it's very obvious in the Old Testament when you're looking for it. A lot of Jews during Jesus' day and Paul's day didn't read a lot of those texts as what we call messianic. 
a lot of times they believed that there was two different servants of the Lord that would come. One that would be the Messiah, the king, who would rule and reign. And another one who would be some kind of suffering servant who would go through hardship and, and know what it was like to be one of God's people and, and suffer and still be found faithful. And they didn't see those as one person. They saw those as two people. And yet, if you were to ask them, what was the suffering servant going to accomplish? They'd say, we don't know. And Paul comes to say, the king, the Messiah, is that suffering servant. And he uses scripture to prove it. And then he doesn't, doesn't talk about Jesus right away. He says, this is what scripture tells us about the Messiah when he comes. And then he says, and let me tell you about Jesus of Nazareth who did all of that. And he uses that to, to show a proof that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. God's anointed king. And we're told the response to this is that some Jews and a lot of Gentiles put their faith in Jesus, including a lot of leading women were, were told in the city. By the way, this is what happened in Philippi too. The first convert that we're told about in Europe is a woman named Lydia. Here, there's a group of people that come to know Jesus that start the church in Thessalonica, um, and there are some Jews, there's some Gentiles, God-fearing Gentiles, including some, some women that, that are uh, they were called, they were called leading women. That means they were, they were women who had um, probably had some money and some, uh, some semblance of power, you know, business women, kind of like Lydia would have been. Um, and they are early converts to following Jesus. And we're told, but then Jews, the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the whole world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. <clears throat> so this power struggle comes up right away. Paul and, and company have been there for about three weeks. They're preaching, and, and some, of the other, uh, some of the other Jewish men who have not put their faith in Jesus are not happy with the fact that these people are being won over to put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. And so out of that jealousy, they wind up um, riling up the city. And we're actually told that they did something kind of, kind of a little sneaky. It says they riled up um, the rabble. It's a weird phrase. You're like, what does that mean? What it means is they actually would go to places where they knew people that were kind of ornery and disreputable and apt to cause problems and might be even open to a little bit of coin to do so. So they probably went to like a local tavern or someplace like that and they said, hey, we got a, it's the middle of the day, we got a bunch of guys sitting around here. You know, they're kind of ne'er-do-wells, and they were like, hey, we're going to get, probably, we're going to give you some money. We need you to go start riling everybody up, start whispering in people's ears about uh, this, these out-of-towners that are coming and causing problems. And the guys happily go along with it. And they do. They rile up the city. This is much like what hap happened in Philippi, though the, the, the people who are... are upset or jealous here, their motives are different. If you remember in Philippi, the issue was the girl, um, the, the demon-possessed slave girl was set free. And it was her owners who were upset about their loss of profit that wound up riling up the people and getting Paul and Silas arrested. 
So they were concerned about profit. The Jews weren't, uh, Jewish men that did this weren't concerned about profit. They were concerned about losing followers. Because if suddenly, you know, these, some, some of their fellow Jews and some God-fearing Gentiles are, are following after this Jesus, maybe these other Jews who aren't believing that are going to lose their influence. By the way, this is exactly what happened in, in Jerusalem in the very early days of the church. This will continue to happen. People don't like their power being questioned. So they go around and they find, um, they, can, they, they look for Paul and Silas, who are the main preachers at this point in time, and they can't find them. So they drag out some of the new local converts. So some, some people that have come to know Jesus, including a man named Jason. We don't know hardly anything about Jason other than he was probably Greek because his name is Greek. Um, and he must be some kind of leader or person of prominence because he's named. He uh, obviously has at least a little bit of money because of something that happens in a few minutes. But. Uh, and they wind up um, charging these men um, with a couple of things. They say they're charged with public disturbance. So that would be kind of more against Paul and Silas, but then Jason and company... Um, you guys are harboring these disturbers of the peace. So you guys are in trouble for it too. And then they say you're defying Caesar. And those three charges are kind of brought against these men. Um, Paul and Silas who are not present and then Jason and, and these other converts. The charge of defying Caesar was actually based on the claim that Jesus is king. So it, it says in the text that they defied the decrees of Caesar and claim there is another king, Jesus. Now here's the thing. Other religions that were fully accepted in, in the Roman Empire had their ideas of God kings. Like the idea that the Caesar was the one and only king and the, and the king above all kings and and no other king could be above him, was never really accepted. For instance, the, the predominant um, religion of the Greco-Roman world was the Greco-Roman religion, um, taking its form in uh, Zeus in Greek language, or Jupiter in the Roman language, being the king of the gods. And he was also, because he was the king of the gods, he was the king of everything. The Caesar, the emperor, wasn't claiming to be above Zeus. That wouldn't have gone over. But he was saying, there will be no king on earth above me. No one can claim to be king in my empire. I am the only king. Now, if you know anything about New Testament, um, the New Testament, there are other kings in the New Testament, are there not? Anybody can think of a king in the New Testament? Herod. Herod is King Herod. So were they breaking the rules? And the short answer to that is no, because they had made an exception for Israel. Outside of um, the region known as Idumea, um, the Judean area, where Israel, Jerusalem, all that is, um, no kings. You could have governors, you could have prefects, you could have all these other things, but no kings. They made an exception for the Jewish people because the Jewish people kept revolting against them. So they said, we will let you have a king, but your king, we will get to determine who it was. And they always picked somebody who they could control and manipulate, and Her the, the line of Herod was that line. Who was not, by the way, fully Jewish. They weren't really Jewish in their faith. They were really just figureheads. Pontius Pilate is a governor. He's not a king. The king is Caesar and no one else. So this idea that, you know, this religious group is claiming to have a God king, Jesus, 
that wouldn't have been out of line. They would have been like, yeah, I mean, every, don't, we have Zeus. What's, you know, or, or, yeah, if you go over to Turkey, they've got, or over to Asia Minor, they've got, you know, they have Artemis, or I know they've got the Baals. There's all kinds of those. That wouldn't have been an issue for them. However, Paul's preaching on Jesus is not simply that he is a God king, but he is a God man who is, who would come again to be king. And that would sound like a threat to the rule of the emperor. Because nowhere in those other religions was there this concept that the reign of a king, a human king, would be eventually overthrown, so to speak, by the reign of the god king. Zeus was not a threat if you're the emperor. Zeus didn't want to come down and rule and reign humans any more than he did for Mount Olympus in their mind. But if you look at the writing that Paul has later on back to this church in what the letters we have called 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, overwhelmingly, those two letters, he repeatedly says things like, now referring to when Jesus the king returns, like I said to you before when I was there, that's a very different thing. And we might, maybe as, as modern Christians, we don't really get this, but think about this. When Jesus returns, will we have... Um, well, first of all, let me ask this. When Jesus returns, will there still be w world rulers besides Jesus? The short answer to that is biblically, yes, there will be. There will still be people on earth that don't believe in Jesus and have other rulers. But Jesus will come and say, I am your king. And he will establish his kingdom in Jerusalem, and those who belong to him will rule and reign with him there, physically, on earth. That is a threat to other kingdoms. In fact, you know, depending on your end times view, but like if, if you believe in what we call a premillennial reign, um, or a millennial reign of Christ on earth, like for a thousand years Jesus will rule and reign physically on earth, that, that means that that all those other kingdoms are going to have to kind of in some way contend with or deal with King Jesus. And if, if your view is what we call premillennialism, at the end of that time period, those kingdoms, those human kingdoms, will be raised up to go to war against Jesus and the saints by Satan. They won't like the fact that he's been ruling and reigning for a thousand years. He will be a threat to them. And Caesar may have taken this idea of this man, this human being, who, who will come and become king of the world as a threat. And now whether this, the emperors actually thought that way or not, it's pretty well understood that the Thessalonican leadership would have. Um, this is a, this is a, a biblical scholar and, and historian who writes on this. He says, since Thessalonica would want to maintain its status as a free city through loyalty to the emperor, what does that mean? Free city means that they could have some semblance of, of control over their own government and their own dealings. If they weren't a free city, they were an occupied city, which means they had Roman troops there, they'd have a Roman governor, Rome would micromanage them. They didn't want that. So since they wanted to maintain their status as a free city, they would have to show that they're loyal to the emperor. And since the local officials are charged with preserving order and making sure the imperial decrees are respected, the charges understandably throw the crowd and city officials into turmoil. These guys are claiming there's another king. Oh, we don't want anything to do with that. Nope. Nope, nothing to do with that. Why? Because we don't want the emperor coming down on us. Now, the problem is, of course, they don't have the guys who are preaching. Um, we don't know where Paul and Silas are, but it, this probably happened in a quick order, and they might have, we don't, we're not told they're hiding, they just probably didn't know where they're at. They might have been somewhere else. And so they arrest Jason and these other new converts, and Jason gives them bond money to the officials allowing for him and the other people to be released. Now, if you think that this was a bribe, it could have been, 
but it was probably bond money. They were arrested. And so they're like, we'll let you go um, under some conditions. You give us this money, we will hold on to it. And if those conditions are met, you get your money back. If those conditions are not met, we keep your money and we come looking for you. That's how it still works today. What are the conditions? Well, the conditions would have been no more public disturbances, no more of this preaching in public stuff. We're done with that. The second is that Paul and Silas would need to leave the city. And actually, they do that. When they find out what's happened, Paul and Silas are encouraged by, by the new Christians. They said, you know, for your own safety and for us, maybe it's time to leave town. And they do. They've been there for about three weeks or more at this point in time, and they do. They wind up leaving town. And they go to another town called Berea. And we're going to talk about Berea next week and how the response in Berea is just a 180-degree different response than what they've received so far. In fact, you will find many, many churches today that will, like, when you got to, you know, what are we going to call ourselves? Uh, one, a bigger church in the Twin Cities is Berean Baptist. And I didn't know, I'm like, why is it Berean? Is that the name of the town you're in or something? No. They're like, we want to be like the church in Berea. That's who we want to be. We'll talk about them next week. So here's the power struggle that we see going on here. And this has a direct application for us today. The question is, who is the king? Now, ironically, the Jews that led to this riot and this arrest and everything, they were led by misguided zeal to protect the reputation and glory of God. They weren't they were like, we don't want this, this weird concept catching root. And what they wound up doing is it undermined it instead. The glory of God was undermined and the reputation of God was undermined by their, their zeal. And what they wound up doing is actually declaring allegiance to Caesar over Jesus. And you might say, that's so weird. That is not the first time this has happened in the New Testament. If you remember, when Jesus is arrested and he is before Pilate, Pilate asks him a question. He says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers that question. He says, that's what you call me. And then he goes to the crowd and he says, Behold your king. And they say, no, we have no king but Caesar. Why? Because they're afraid. They're afraid of Caesar. Now, to be clear, nowhere in this was Paul demanding that Christians disobey Caesar. He wasn't preaching hey, you don't have to listen to Caesar anymore. you got a new king. It's Jesus. That's not what he was saying. They, missed, they twisted what he was saying to get him out of there. In fact, Paul, to the church in Rome, tells them that they're supposed to listen to Caesar. And Peter does the same thing in his, in, in his first epistle. He says, you're supposed to listen to the emperor. Do that. But when there's conflict between what the emperor is saying and what God is commanding, God is your higher authority. When there's not conflict, you listen to Caesar. It's not a big deal. It's when Jesus says, give to Caesar what's Caesar's. It's fine. But when there's conflict, God is the higher authority. Now, sometimes I think we struggle with this. I think sometimes, and we should struggle with this. This is not a straightforward, easy cut, you know, thing. Because sometimes Caesar asks for things that aren't Caesar's. Sometimes rulers ask for things that they should not be allowed to have. But then sometimes we also take that we have no king but Jesus to the extreme of saying, I don't have to listen to anything else. Well, that's not true either. We have to weigh that and say, is following the authority in contradiction to following God, or is there times where following the authority is actually what God is telling us to do? And we have to weigh that against Scripture. And when the authority is off base from Scripture, then we say, I, I can't. I can't.
can't listen. And then there's consequences for that. If we think there's not consequences for not listening to authority, we're fooling ourselves. And if we scream and cry when there are consequences, then we're not paying attention to the scripture. Of course there's consequences. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. If, if, if human authorities are in contradiction to, to God's authority, and we say we're not going to listen to that human authority, there will be consequences. We shouldn't be surprised by that, and we shouldn't complain about it. Guess what the early church did? They celebrated it. They said, we, we get to suffer for Jesus. Good for us. When Jesus stood in contrast to earthly authorities, they killed him for it. And he didn't complain while they did it. But at the same time, we have to ask the question, is it against God's word? Is it against God's authority? Or is it just something we don't like? Because we have to be careful about that too. And we have to wrestle with that stuff. We can't just pretend it doesn't exist or just say, well, it's always this or it's always that. No, we have to wrestle with it against Scripture. And regardless of, of kind of how, you know, how we land, and by the way, when we wrestle with that against Scripture, let me just say, we might not always come to the same conclusions about that. That's okay. You can come to different conclusions, but we need to have an openness to let the Word of God instruct us, inform us, and correct us about whatever conclusion we have. And if our conclusion doesn't land with Jesus as the ultimate authority, that our ultimate allegiance is to King Jesus, then we're wrong. And by the way, sometimes our ultimate allegiance to King Jesus will not put us in contradiction with the, the earthly authorities. It doesn't always. And you might say, how is that the case? Well, if you read those two texts I just pointed out, they both talk about how God is the one who puts people in positions of authority. Now, whether they use those positions correctly or not, or for God-honoring purposes, is another story. But sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. And then we have to wrestle with that. And it's not easy. To give you an idea of this, and I don't want to belabor this point too much, but in the 1930s in Germany, there were many Christians that saw the rise of a movement that was talking about nationalistic pride, that talked about um, how we need to be very careful and, uh, and maybe even violent towards people who are not like us. And some Christians in Germany said, that doesn't line up with Scripture. And other Christians said, sounds good to me. Lines up with what I already believe, so I'm good. And what happened is that power structure took hold. And the Nazi party started ruling Germany in the 1930s and the 1940s. And Hitler and the Nazis took power. And we, I think as Americans in our century, we're like, Phew. I can't believe that would happen. That's ridiculous. It's, it's not ridiculous. It's happened multiple times throughout history. What did the church do in response to the Nazis? Well, the official church of Germany went along with them. They said, we don't want to rock the boat. We're going to listen to what they're saying. We're not going to cause problems. We don't want to lose our position go along with it. The, the National Lutheran Church of Germany officially went along with the Nazi party. And there was a whole movement of Christians that said, we cannot with clear conscience, we cannot, based on the word of God, go along with this. And they started hiding Jews and other people that were being targeted and smuggling them out of the country or hiding them in their homes. Some of them were even so convicted that they took up arms 
and plotted assassination attempts. One of those latter people was a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who said, in clear conscience, I cannot look at this and say that this has any semblance to the gospel. I cannot do anything about this. In fact, if you ever read the history of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he had the opportunity to teach at Union Theological Seminary in New York City in the late 1930s when he saw the rise of the Nazi movement, and he was concerned about it. And he said, I can't abandon my country. I can't abandon people who need Jesus right now. And he went back. And he actually stood as a resistor to the Nazi movement. He was later arrested by the Nazis and charged with collaboration with an assassination attempt against Hitler himself. We actually don't know 100% if that was true or not. But in one of his writings, called Letters from Prison, which he wrote while he was in prison, he said, I never understood. <clears throat> I never understood how a God of love could call people to war. But sometimes great evil arises, and violence might be the only solution. And he said that. By the way, I'm not promoting the use of violence. We don't know if he did that or not, but we do know this. The gospel and his preaching of the gospel was such a threat that Hitler and others had him arrested and put in prison. And when they knew they were going to lose, literally, Allied tanks were like on the way to the prison where he was being held. Their last order was, Bonhoeffer doesn't come out of this alive. And they shot him, firing squad. Before that, he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And through that entire time, his letters to prison, all of that, when you read those works, not once does he complain about his poor treatment. Not once. He's like, this is what it means to live out the gospel in a world that is contradictory to it. And he praises God for it. And he's not the only example of that. There are thousands, millions of examples and so when we wrestle with this idea of ultimate allegiance, realize ultimate allegiance may cost us something. It always costs us something. But if we complain about what it costs us, I think that that might mean that we like, love the thing that costs us a little too much. Our ultimate allegiance is to King Jesus. God is our ultimate authority in all things. All things. And Jesus is our eternal king. Now, does that mean you can't have an earthly king too? No, you can have an earthly king. But Jesus is the king of kings. That expression literally means he is the king above every other king. He's the king over them. And so when the earthly king is wrong, you say, I have to follow the eternal king. It doesn't mean you, you don't ever, you say, I don't acknowledge an earthly king. No. That would be not acknowledging people that God has put in those positions. Now, you might also acknowledge that they didn't use those positions for godly purpose. That's, and that's, a, that's something we have to wrestle with. We can't ignore. So here's our so what. Is our ultimate authority, uh, is Jesus our ultimate authority and true king? And how do we show this with our lives? How do we show people that Jesus is our king, our ultimate king? It's one thing to say, I don't like decisions that governments or governors or whoever makes and just complain about it. But are we living in a way that says that's not, they're not the ultimate authority over my life, but also they're not the ones I live for. This is our meditation verse for this week. I thought this was appropriate. This is... This is Jesus' interaction with Pilate about who's the king. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. 
For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus defines his kingship by being the author of truth. 